podcast may contain graphic descriptions and or explicit content that may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hi everybody, I'm Key. And I'm B. And this is We Shouldn't Talk About This. <laughs> so Key, on this week's episode, what should we not talk about? Let's not talk about cults. Cults? Yeah, because you might get drafted into one unknowingly. You know, sometimes, well, I guess I guess they're good. At, I guess they do it on purpose. They're really good at convincing you that, like, you know, it's a pretty dope organization. Yeah. So, you... so sometimes I can see these people falling into these things because I've been scammed by dudes in Jamaica before. Oh, I thought you were going to say by cults. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Um, I mean, it could have happened since I was scammed by dudes in Jamaica. You were young and unlearned, trusting, very trusting, a little wide-eyed babe in the woods. She won her free Mercedes. Mm. Never came to fruition. Well, damn. Anyway, Colts. (laughs) Colts. Would you, after researching this, would you think you'd be able to? To be like, no, this is a cult. I'm not. I'm not doing this. Or do you think that you could get wooed in? With mine, I would be like, nah, this isn't real. But just for mine though, if I see what other cults have to offer, I may have like you know been like, hmm, I can see this happening. But with this one, this one's far fetched. Now with mine, I can see how people initially got pulled in, but. Staying, I don't understand, but I think it's it's something, it's some kind of phenomenon, like where there's a lot of people. If something happens, like the like everybody will be like, oh well, someone else will do it, and and everybody thinking that no one else actually does anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think they were like, if it was really bad, someone would say something, and in that sense that nobody said anything because they all assumed somebody else would say something (laughs) oh my gosh but that is like a real phenomenon i just can't think of what the name of it is so the cult i'm going to talk about is the source oh another catchy name like it yes now not completely 100 percent defunct but not operational like it used to be. But we'll get to that. So, James Edward Baker was born on July 4th, 1922 in Cincinnati, Ohio. He served in the Marine Corps during World War II, where he claimed to have been awarded the Silver Star for his actions. But the Corps doesn't have James Edward Baker's name in its official listing of Silver Star recipients. So we don't know how true that is. He also claimed to be a jujitsu master. Now, early life wasn't very apparent, but once, you know, Baker got out of the Marine Corps and mastered jujitsu, he obtained himself a family, which he ditched for a life and show business in LA as a stuntman. As you do? Yes. Once in L.A., he was accused of killing the husband of actress Jean Ingram with a jiu-jitsu chop to the throat. Whoa. But he was never convicted of the offense. And Baker claimed that he took another life using the same method. So this, um, this throat chop is He is just out here <laughs> <laughs> chopping throats and taking names. Why you say around here, chop that throat? <laughs> So in the early 60s, Baker experimented with LSD, as you did in the 60s, and speed before turning to spiritualism and mysticism. Hmm. He went to stunder under Yogi Bahan, a Sikh spiritual leader and teacher of Kundalini Yoga, which I've taken. It's very, um, like that type, like it's about vibration and uh, yeah. it's, it's, it was nice. The, the class that I took, I liked it. It was like a... A private class at the teacher's house with one of my friends. So 
That's crazy. Like, I thought that was just Hollywood yoga. Like, you know, yoga they do on TV shows to make it funny, you know, get humorous in a way, but that's a actual type of yoga. Yeah, it's like all about like vibrations and becoming one. Like, it's a, it's a lot noisier than regular yoga because you have to like make the noises. Depending on the person though, because some people the stretch and yoga start popping. Like, everything yeah. start clack, 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 clacking. And... Yeah, like me coming down the stairs, my knees just yeah. <laughs> sound like chiclets in a glass jar. <laughs> the stove popcorn. <laughs> anyway. So, Baker left Yogi behind in the late 1960s and created his own philosophy based on Western mystery tradition and changed his name to Father Yod, Y-O-D. As Father Yod, Baker became a spiritual leader who combined the virtues of healthy eating, yoga, meditation, and a number of other practices that were not as popular at the time but now they're super common. Hmm. Like, you know, there's this whole wave of veganism and yoga, like. Oh, is, is he the OG of that? He he's OG not the, is? well, he's one of the OGs for hmm. the US. Like, you know, yoga came over from Asia. Asia. So, you know, he's not that OG, but he's a US OG. Wow. So actually my first hot yoga class was in Utah in Salt Lake City. It doesn't, it doesn't get hot there, it does it? Like it, like, it doesn't naturally get hot there, does it? I was there, like, in the summer going into winter. Mm. But, you know, they, like, put you in a room and crank the heat up to over 100. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, hot yoga. I'm yeah. Thinking, uh, I think of, like, hot springs. Oh, I, I was in one of them, too, in Idaho. In Idaho. Yeah, no, that thing was hot. <laughs> Not tepid springs, it's hot springs. And you turn the, the bath nozzle all the way to H and just yeah. let it ride. Yeah, and just sit there. Mm. I'd be hurting. <laughs> now, and on April 1st, 1969, Father Yode opened one of the, it says the world's first health food restaurants in LA on the Sunset Strip. And it was called the Source Restaurant. It offered vegetarian-only food served by a collective of young hippies dressed in white robes. And the restaurant claimed that its menu was based on the dietary wisdom found in the teachings of Jesus Christ and revealed through the Essene Gospels of Peace. And I know, right? The restaurant was not only the perfect recruiting tool for the Source family, but it quickly became popular with celebrities like Marlon Brando, John Lennon, Julie Christie, Greta Garbo, Woody Allen, he like filmed a movie there. Like this place was was popping. They were making an alleged ten thousand dollars a day at their peak. At a restaurant? Yes. Wow. Now, um, one of the websites had a a sample of their salad menu. Now in nineteen sixty nine their prices weren't even it was like two three dollars for a salad mm. so can you imagine how much business they were getting to make ten thousand dollars a day that's crazy that's, that's a lot crazy. of lettuce that's a lot of lettuce literally and figuratively <laughs> so with that type of money coming in father yo began to expand the restaurant to more of a scene he began offering yoga classes and was often seen driving a white Rolls Royce in which he was known to pick up young, impressionable girls and bring them back to his a yoga studio, wink, wink, inside the restaurant. You know, was, young girls are always the downfall of a cult leader. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, honestly, damn you young girls. Could have something good there. Ruin it. Now, eventually, Father Yod amassed a following of 140 to 150 followers, all who rid themselves of their belongings to move closer to their earthly spiritual father. And they lived together in a two story red brick home that had eight bedrooms and 24 bathrooms. It was. Wait, like, 
Eight bedrooms, 24 bathrooms? Four bathrooms, a total of 24 rooms. Oh, okay. My bed. Okay. So, they all, 140, 150 of them, crammed inside this house. Every possession was communal, except for Father Yoke's stuff. Of course. And everyone changed their last names to a Aquarian, and people picked new first names. Their middle names were The. So the family ended up with names like Electricity, The Aquarian, Isis, The Aquarian, Sunflower, Galaxy, Harvest Moon, Ho, Yahava, and Olympus. Many of them have kept their source names to this day. Like Isis, um, she was the family historian. So she is still known as Isis Aquarian. And her pictures, videos, everything are like out online. Mm. So it's, it's really easy to find like a lot of pictures from when they were together. Now, music became an integral part of the Source family, and many members were musicians. Father Yod formed an improvisational psychedelic rock band he called Yohoa 13, with himself as the lead singer. And, no, Yahoa, which is like a take on the Hebrew Yehuda. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1973, the band began making limited pressings of their jam sessions, eventually releasing nine albums that were sold at the Source restaurant for $10 each. These, that's five salads. Right. But just think, like, CDs are $10 now. <laughs> like, <laughs> he was making good money. That's why he was raking in 10000 a day. Yeah, what's good? But you can look up... Yahoo 13 on YouTube and listen to the music, which I did, and it actually wasn't bad. Oh, I bet not. Like psychedelic stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So later in 1973, the Source family was kicked out of the mansion after neighbors complained. Like, you know, mm -hmm. so many people just milling around. Like, nobody had any other job but working at the Source restaurant. So, you know, they were out. You know, doing yoga on the grass and all type of weird stuff. So the neighbors complained. And this was like Hollywood Hills area where they were, where they were living. Yeah, if you had a white Rolls Royce, then he totally, fed it. he totally fit in there. Yeah, like his house was the former house of a newspaper magnate. So you can imagine where they were living. Now, after the complaints and them getting kicked out of the mansion, they, Father Goad and his 140 to 150 followers, moved into a three-bedroom home in Nicholas Canyon. Three bedrooms. That's just downside, though. That's good bit. Yeah. 150 people in three bedrooms. Yeah, wait. <laughs> That's like 50 people to a room. You don't, you don't have a room to do yoga. You don't even have room to lay down and sleep. Everybody has to like stand mm. as one solid unit so nobody falls over while they sleep. Oh my gosh. Now, pressure from law enforcement regarding the, present, uh, the presence of underage girls began to haunt the family. Father Yod also began suffering from delusions of grandeur as most all cult leaders do. And he started believing that he was God. Mm. This is where it starts to get culty. Now, from a, a cult standpoint, this was not like super like, you know, give me all your money, listen to only me mm -hmm. type of cult. You know, this was more like he had good fundamental principles and was super charismatic, so people followed him. But he wasn't really gaining. Like, you know, he wasn't taking their money. He wasn't saying, you got to sell your house and give me the money. Or you got we got to live at your house or use it for our purposes. Like, he right. wasn't 
bilking people out of their possessions in order to satisfy his own, you know, worldly needs and wants. Yeah. He was more like, you know, y'all need to eat right and exercise. Come work at my restaurant. You'll eat right and exercise and live in my house. Mm. Just do what I say. <laughs> so, he become delusional thinking he was the actual God. And after allegedly bringing a stillborn baby back to life, CPR, he had a mission to populate the world with even more babies. So, what did he do? He began having sex with his underage disciples. Mm. His first and only legal wife, Robin, did not like this. And she spoke out against it. And she was swiftly replaced by a younger wife. Oh, now, Robin was only 20. So he, he replaced her with somebody younger than that. Dang. Then with an additional 12 wives, most of which were underage runaways. Oh, by 1974, Father Yode had become paranoid believing the government was coming after him either for his underage marriages, quote, heavy quotation on the marriages, or his shady tax dealings. Then a hospital alerted the authorities when the family brought a child in that nearly died from an easily treatable staph infection. So one of his rules for being in the source family was basically food is the cure they did not take medical advice. So not only was the medical situation bringing attention, the underage runaways were being missed by their families. And some of them had come from influential or rich families themselves. Oh yeah, you know, you mess with those. So Father Yeld sold the source restaurant and moved the family to Hawaii. Just like that. Just like that. Now, despite their supposed fortune, the trip to Hawaii nearly bankrupted the Source family, due in part to Father Yod's insistence that they buy a private plane and a boat for their island lifestyle. So, he technically was the only one making money because it was his restaurant, so I can't say he shouldn't have done it. It right. was his money. It was his money. He was the restaurant owner. Yeah. I mean, it seems a little selfish. <laughs> yeah. Taking a hundred something people to Hawaii <laughs> with nothing, knowing that they own nothing, they have nothing, that you were their only source of income, which really you wasn't income. Source. Right, the <laughs> source. So... Things quickly grew desperate, and Father Yod instructed his male disciples to trim their hair and beards and find jobs as soon as possible in Hawaii. Hawaii. Meanwhile, Father Yod became more detached from reality, spiraling into delusions of his own godliness before veering into rage and frustration over not being welcomed with open arms to this supposed paradise. Now, the locals in Hawaii, for the most part, believed that the group was going to follow in the footsteps of other cults like the Manson family or the People's Temple. Like, you know, they had already given cults bad names. Yeah. So, of course, if you see a large group of mostly Caucasian people move to Hawaii, you're going to be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. What are y'all doing? Yeah, it's like... Y'all don't have a camera crew, so what's going on here? Right, and this was 74. Mm. So, you know, they were like, don't come to Hawaii trying to take our jobs. Yeah. Because guess what? This is also America. Yeah. And we don't like outsiders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, that right there was really why they didn't get the warm welcome that he thought they were going to get i mean hawaii would be like almost a perfect place vegetarian 
into exercise. Like mm -hmm. he could have started another source restaurant on the beach and yeah. had money hand over fist. But yeah. unfortunately it did not work out like that. Now on August 5th, 1975, Father Yo decided to go hang gliding. The only issue was that he'd never tried hang gliding before. Now, many members of the family went up the 1,300 or 400 meters for our international listeners, Foot Cliff, on the eastern shore of Oahu. Now, there's video, like I said, um, Isis Aquarian. She used to video, photo, everything. So there's video of him attempting to take off. In the footage, he could be seen leaping into the air and immediately falling out of the sky. Ooh. Father Go landed on the beach, and when the followers reached their guru, he was still alive, but he couldn't move. He died nine hours later. He's in agony, oh my gosh. Or maybe he was paralyzed and he couldn't feel nothing. Let's, let's look for the silver lining on this dark cloud. <laughs> now, the family attempted to stay together, but after two very difficult years in Hawaii without Yod's guidance or the cash flow from the restaurant, the family split and hit the fields and the streets of Hawaii in 1977. Many of them without means, meaning money, and in shock after living communally for six and seven years. I mean, can you imagine having to go back to the real world? Especially being a young person with yeah. no kind of like sense of responsibility or experience for everyday life. Right. So Isis, Isis Aquarian, she was one of his 14 wives. Um, and she was the dedicated family historian. Like I said, she kept all the family records on tape, video, and photo while the family was together. She even wrote a book and she helped make a feature length documentary called The Source in 2012. And it's like the fundamentals of what he was about. I could definitely get down with, you know, I partake in the veganism every now and then, like not today, but probably like five days a week yeah, when yeah. I'm doing bad, like, you know, when I'm doing good, I can go for months. Mm -hmm. So like, if I was to go into a restaurant and they were like, hey, we're a vegetarian restaurant and we have a yoga studio in the back and we'll take care of you if you just want to work here, sign me up. I can definitely see the appeal of that, like into that perspective. Like this, this call right here definitely started out very normal and really cool, but then it soon after it became a cult. Unfortunately, for the, you know, the young members have to deal with that and have to well, they looked up to him, so they just had to follow follow where he went. Yod, Yodis? Yod. Yod. <laughs> they had to follow where the yod, where the yod went. Yeah, but like there were people who said that the, the documentary from 2012 um, kind of painted everything in like this nice light, but people who were actually part of the family well, some people said that it was, you know, like he was really strict, like he had his own Ten Commandments, but he called them, you know, guidelines. Like they don't take precedent over the biblical Ten Commandments, but if you're going to live here with us, you have to abide by these rules. And, you know, he was very much uh, that he had say so over all the women. And, you know, if he didn't like who you were with, he would make you become spiritually married to someone else oh, wow. like you know he was he was very into the controlling aspect of cult leaders and the underage girl aspects now he did have some alleged shady money dealings mm -hmm. but other than that like you know no one was killed no one killed themselves no one got hurt except for him yeah. Like, you know, it, all in all, I think this is a cult I'd probably be a part of. Yeah, that that's, that sounds pretty, that sounds like a pretty good cult on the scale of cults, you know, <laughs> in, in, that, in that entire realm of, you know, is it like a terrible suicide cult or is it like a 
fun loving eat your vegetables cold eat your vegetables cold <laughs> <laughs> man that was very interesting so that one lasted for how long again uh the source restaurant opened in 1969 and that was his recruiting spot and he died in 1975 so oh gosh, that so was a very quick climax and downhill Oh, you should say downhill. Oh, yeah, yeah. too soon. Very, very <laughs> well, that was a very, very interesting cult. Um, my cult is in the other direction. Like, you know, my cult is very serious and it lasted quite a while. But my cult is also French, and French is one of the languages I struggle most with. So, we. Oui. I'm going to pronounce a lot of stuff incorrectly here, so just be prepared. Like, isn't the last letter of every word silent or something weird like that? I mean, you can tell me because I went, because like in, I can't pronounce, I can't pronounce any names in Mississippi or Louisiana. So, I don't know. Anyway, this is the Order of the Solar Temple. Or in French, Ordre or du Temple Solaire. The Order of the Soul Temple was founded by Joseph D. Mambro and Lou Giraud. De Mambro was born August 19, 1924, in Pont Saint Esprit in France. And very early in life, uh, De Mambro was interested in spirituality, which is strange because it wasn't until he was about 32 that he became a member of the Resicurian uh, Res Order which is an, uh, the ancient and mystic order of the Rosy Cross. And that's a philosophical and educational organization that, that's still around today. And then, and, um, and, and he, he only he was with them for 13 years. And so even though he left, he still, he still like, you know, their influence was still apparent in his ideals and practices for the rest of his life. So the beginning of 1970s, um, the Mambro got in trouble for swindling, and he left uh, southern France and settled near the Swiss border. In 73, he was initiated in the Center for Preparing the New Age, becoming a full-time spiritual master uh, only three years after that. Wait, full-time? Like... Yeah, full-time, like, you know, nine to five. He's, oh, he's, right. a, he's about to prepare for the new age. He's ready. Well, you stay ready. You don't have to get ready. That's right. <laughs> the um, the group purchased a home. Uh, the group purchased a house in Geneva where they practice communal life and ex ex hold on ex exoteric ceremonies. That's not a French word, but that one just caught me off guard. However, De Mambo felt that in order for the group to expand, they needed a charismatic leader. The man, the man Din left the center of preparing for new age and found the Golden Way Foundation in Geneva. And this I feel like he just like religion hops. Yeah, yeah, he because like because like he had these ideals and then he just wanted to he wanted to make sure he wanted to make sure that all of them were properly together. Like you know, he just wanted different ideas and then combine them and be like, you know what? Now I'm the enlightened one. I know what's really going on here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this foundation was the heart of his organization for several years. So from 1978 to about 1993. Mm. That's a while. Yeah. The official statement um, for the Golden Way Foundation contained the main idea of a world in transition, as well as a theme of chivalry. The member was still looking for a charismatic leader, though, that he wanted on his side. And in 1980, he was introduced to Gerald, who was a man born in Kikwik, Belgian Congo. The member then arranged for Gerald to meet Julian Origas, a supposed former uh, Gestapo, Gestapo agent who founded the Renewed Order of the Temple. And that's a group that combined Templar and Rastrocarian ideals. Hmm. Did you know that the Congo was a French colony? I did not know that. Yeah, the French colonized them, so they speak French. Mm, okay, okay. But they're in Africa, yeah. Africa. Yeah. Oh, man. The French had a lot of, uh, a lot of, like, uh, 
colonies. Yeah, a lot of colonies around the world, yeah. Yeah. Not more than Britain, though. No, <laughs> more than Britain. <laughs> In 1981, uh, Jerome became a member of the of the renewed order of the temple. And when Julian died in 1983, Jerome became grandmaster. Mm. Within a year, however, he was forced out of the group, but he took half of the members with him. Jerome, already involved with the Manbrose group since, since like the early 80s, was then able to fill the Manbrose need for a charismatic leader. Because not only was Jerome char um, half charisma, he was a physician and as such would be taken more seriously. I was just about to say that. Like people would definitely believe him if he's the doctor. Yeah, yeah. And then together, those two found the order of the Sola Temple. <laughs> With the Mambo taking the back, the backstage role and, and allowing Jerome to put on the show. This plan was successful to a degree because Jerome drew hundreds to his lectures, spoke out on the radio, and he gave lectures in Switzerland, France, and Canada. And then he even started having the idea of creating clubs to feed into the group and spread his ideology while leading more concrete action with, um, while leading more concrete action. And for like a six year, for a six year period, the group consisted of three, three different areas. The first was the external activity which consisted of lectures and seminars given by Giro and others under the heading of the Amanta. Those prepared to go further could join the exoteric structure, the Archadia Club, and then the final level was initiation, initi initial, initiatory, initiatory order called the International Chivalric Organization of the Solar Tradition. Now these were paid tiers. Um, I could not find a other rec like, you know, um, like, you know, Euro uh, exchange or any, like any kind of like metric that they use for tiers, but it's just, they had to pay monthly and some members because they gave, because they, they, they kind of like let everyone know that they are the reincarnation of someone either famous or someone in the religious, like, you know, sector, like someone like from way back when. And, um, this one gentleman, he was... Um, he was a watchmaker, I believe, but he was really rich. So they immediately told him, they're like, you, you are the re reincarnation of this noble knight that fought alongside our Lord and Savior. And this guy, he was like, you know what? I am. And so like, he just gave him so much money. And so they started, they started telling him like, you know, all the. So basically feeding his ego to get his money. Yeah, oh yeah, exactly. That's what this, um, that's what this, that's what, that's what they did a lot. You know, they definitely took a lot of money. From, um, from the people involved. But then things started getting tricky because in the early 90s, some members began distancing themselves from the group, both in terms of audience as well as financially. Donors began, donors began asking for reimbursements. People began questioning the many facades of the group, including DeMambro's own son, Eli. DeMambro had claimed the only representative of the masters and the the member will have claimed to be the only representative of the masters in Zurich. And Eli himself began to doubt the existence of these quote unquote masters and had discovered the practice of fakery in his father's production <gasps> of the illusion of spiritual phenomena during the ceremonies. And he spoke out openly against this. So he's saying all those people in the crowd catching the Holy Ghost were not catching the Holy Ghost? Exactly. They were paid actors? Yeah, and that man that stepped in the wheelchair, he could walk the whole time. That spring water is not from the wells of Jerusalem and is not going to bring me prosperity? Apparently not. That's what Eli is saying. Oh my gosh. And Demambro, he even considered himself to be the third reincarnation of Jesus Christ himself. If he was the third, then what happened? Because there was supposed to be a second coming. Like, the second coming was supposed to be the end of the world. So, what happened to number two? <laughs> Interesting you may ask that. So, so this, so the main concept of this, you know, um, he, he was with an organization that was preparation for a new age. Mm -hmm. So, Demambro was under the understanding that this world is ending. So, they need to prepare, to, to, they need to prepare their souls to be lifted up and exude to another universe pretty much right, right and so him being jesus christ again he's going to he's going to take his followers leave this crumbling world 
and go to the new universe as Jesus and start the whole thing over, like, you know, start humanity over. And with this, with this, he, the female members of the group, he needed to engage them sexually before ceremonies to open up their uh, spiritual, uh, spiritual essence, I think they called it. Ladies, <laughs> ladies. Ladies. <laughs> oh, goodness. I can't even say anything. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me say this. <laughs> Penises do not open up spiritual essences. <laughs> Take it from me. Even if the man says he's Jesus. Especially if the man says he's Jesus. Because Jesus wouldn't do that. The third incarnation of Jesus. Like, if he said he was the second one... I'd, I'd be okay with you believing it. But the third one, come, read your Bible, people. <laughs> oh, man. So, um, another way of the preparations were to have suicide guilt. So, when you did commit suicide, your soul was lifted up and transported to a new universe to await um, the Man Bro's arrival. So, in their different different homes across the different countries, there are bodies found, you know, there are people, they're poisoned, shot in the head, sometimes even burned alive. Like, the entire house, though, like, everybody burned alive. Like, no one, like, like, no, like no one's remaining, everyone's burned alive. And um, that, that, that one particularly happened in Switzerland, like, in, a, in an October night. And then another one happened in Grunge's Sir Sullivan. And that was 53 people in in that home fire. Wow. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's crazy. But, but I mean, they all, they all were, you know, Jarot's words encouraging them, them seeing Demambro perform, you know, these miracles and, like, you know, watch him work. And they just, you know, they really believed him. And they really believed what he was saying about, you know, our world coming to an end and that they need to prepare their souls to be lifted up and, transit, and transported to the new universe. So why didn't he commit suicide and then come back to prove to everybody? That would have been, that would have been a really good tactic for him to do. That would have been a really good tactic for him to do. See, I can see already I'm getting kicked out of that cult. Yeah, you're asking me questions. I'm asking way too many questions. And, and you're only in tier one, because like, I know you cheap. You're only in tier <laughs> one. So you can't ask those kind of questions. I right better right. shut up and pretend to have the Holy Ghost. <laughs> so in January of 1989, there were 442 members. That, that's across um, uh, France, Switzerland, Canada, and even um, Montague. Wait, Mart Martinique. Mart Martinique. Martinique. That's what, yeah, that's what I was saying. You know? Don't worry, everybody. V really did graduate high school. <laughs> we have a diploma to prove it. <laughs> and, and then, um, I'm sorry, I lost track of where I was. Martinique. Martinique, yeah. And then, in 1997, Demembro got 12 of his closest followers. They reenacted a Last Supper. Like, did they film it? Like, no, they they just recreated it themselves, and they burned the house down as a suicide. Everyone, everyone, everyone who came, knew, everyone except one person uh, who came knew that it was you know for that. The one person that did, the one person that didn't know was someone that tried to back out of the cult, and then the member contacted them, and he was like, okay, like you know, I'll, I'll come meet you. And um, there, there's a video of this on YouTube of the actual man uh, speaking out, like speaking on what happened. And he said that when he got to the house, all the shutters were closed. And the member was like, ah, I left my keys. Like, I lost my keys. Uh, you, you mind waiting for a locksmith with me? And so they hung out for a bit outside the house. The locksmith came in and, um, and the witness said, when the door opened, I smelled nothing but gasoline. And, oh, imme no. and immediately I turned around and walked back to my car. Kudos to you, sir. And um, and then, or ma'am, witness. Kudos to you. Yeah, and then, then the witness stated that that one of the female followers came out and tried to convince him to come back in, but he said, "No, I'm going home." 
This man drove 100 miles. He drove 100 miles to see the man, bro, only to be having to get stalled and try to convince more that he should, you know, join back in the cult. And then, and then John was walking the house and burn alive. Hold on, because here's me and my damn questions again. So there were people in the house when he claimed he was locked out? Mm-hmm. Just sucking up those fumes. Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> these, these characters, man, they're, these people, I mean, they're manipulative. These, these are real people. But I'm, I'm just like, that was a, like a, a whole ruse. Like, you had 11, 12 people sitting in the house. <laughs> While you're pretending to be locked out? <laughs> right. The man bro and Jero are both dead. Mm -hmm. they, did not, they did not come back. They are over at their new universe, mm -hmm. setting up a new life, you know? And that was, that was 97, I believe. No, 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 okay, no, no. So that was 95. But the cult still had... They, they still had a dwindling amount of members like spread out around and right. there were still those members were still like doing suicide deals and like you know in order to reach this this new galaxy this new universe i feel like i vaguely remember this yeah yeah i would have definitely been too young to hear anything about this yeah i was a, i was a teenager I, I was old enough but i feel like i vaguely remember hearing about these suicide these cult suicides yeah, yeah. Yeah. Man, um, unfortunately, this, uh, for, so for this case, for example, if a man did approach me saying, you know, like, you're here, like, like, you know, you're on this earth to serve a higher purpose, you know, we have, we have a group of people that are more enlightened, more awake to the situations going on, we would like for you to come join us, to come, to come, you know, get, get a blessing, and, you know, I honestly wouldn't believe him because, you know, I was like, dude, you don't know me. First of all, you don't know me. Second of all, I don't speak French. I apologize. Wait, so how do you know he just gave you that whole spiel about being enlightened? <laughs> that, that's, because if he came to me with a white robe with a red cross on it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna imagine he's trying to convince me of something. But you know. But yeah, but yeah, this isn't one I would, I would fall for unless I was like you know, an older person by that time. Because like, because the the member himself was like in his forties when he started this. And most of the members were at that age range, and then they brought their children. Oh. Yeah, so, so children, unfortunately, were in these, you know, suicide things, too. Oh, that sucks. That's horrible. Let, yeah. let children make up their own minds once they're adults. Yeah. Let them live to become adults to make up their own minds. There we go. Well, these people were convinced that the world was ending. They didn't want the kid to be on the crumbling world, so they were going to, like, we're going to the new universe. You're going to like it. You're going to be quiet the whole way there. Well... I sincerely hope that new universe is working out for him and it's better than the universe we're in now. Yeah, with all the climate change and stuff. Yeah, that's why we had like four different weather systems come through in three days. Yeah, South Carolina's been in some weird weather, everybody. It was floods Wednesday, tornadoes Thursday. Decent Friday snow on Saturday. It was like a warm Friday and then Saturday. And then rain Sunday. Lots of lots of rain. So, what have we learned from this episode? From this episode, it's okay to, if you're lost, it's okay to join a group um, if like you belong in something. But when the leader starts believing that they are a god of some sort, it's time, it's time to move on. Because that's something that's similar in both our cases. Yes. Um, Yo believed that he, you know, was a god. And the man by believed they were, you know, incarnations of Jesus Christ. Yeah, so find somewhere to belong. Just keep an eye up. Keep an eye out. Do it the right yeah. way. <laughs> yeah, don't, you know, anybody comes up saying they're any reincarnation of... Jesus or God or the Holy Ghost for that matter. Mm -hmm. Don't believe them. Okay, well, no, don't not don't believe them. Be wary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There don't, we go. don't get too close to them. Yeah, be wary. They're asking you to do weird things mm -hmm. like kill yourself. 
Yeah. Don't yeah, do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. I mean, I don't know what I don't know what happens after you die. There could be another universe, you know, that I can transport to. I don't want to find out though. Not anytime like soon. No. Boys that burn alive. Oh, that's hard. Well, I think you suffocate from smoke inhalation first. Like. Well, that's, I mean, that's better than like your flesh catching on fire. Eek. I mean, either way, it isn't fun either way. Either way. Cause like even even if you're volunteering to burn in a house, you're gonna like your lungs are gonna like make you cough and it's just gonna hurt. And yeah. Your eyes are gonna burn and all that stuff. Right, cause if you've ever accidentally burnt some food while you're cooking, then you know the smoke tears your throat and nose up. Mm -hmm. So just imagine just willingly sitting there. Waiting for it to happen. Right. Oh, I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. All right, so how are we going to end this one on a happy note? So, if you listeners each send us a dollar, no, <laughs> <laughs> you will have a first class ticket to spiritual enlightenment for the low, low price. <laughs> But that's only, that's only tier one, though. Tier two. Mm. Tier two gets you a fine, fine cruise to yes. the galaxy of your choice. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but tier three. Tier three. That's like penthouse status. Oh, yeah. Private rocket. We're talking UFOs, people. Directly to a penthouse suite. We're talking teleportation, people. To the penthouse of all galaxies. Mm, you see nothing like it. Not those raggedy galaxies the cruise ships are going to. Yeah, the the, the galaxies of yesteryear. Yeah. Mm -mm. This is first class all the way in tier three. Yeah, and tier three is only a simple payment of 2500 every day. Every day. <laughs> well. So, <laughs> send your checks to P.O. button now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, everyone, um, that is We Shouldn't Talk About This. We Shouldn't Talk About Cults. Thank you so much for listening. Yes. Uh, hit us up on our email. We Shouldn't Talk About This at gmail.com. Instagram and Twitter, WSTAT underscore podcast. And that's where the pictures from all our shows are as well. And also on our Facebook group. Which we've been getting some interaction, and we definitely appreciate you all. Yes, we absolutely do. We appreciate all support. It's just like, you know, a fun show or a nephew to do together. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. He is in my top three nephews. Oh, yeah, that's high praise right there. If yeah. only you knew how many nephews you had. Right, right. Well, I am V. And I'm Key. And thanks for listening. We should talk about this. Bye.